welcome back to our fireside chat, the beginning of our afternoon session. Uh, allow me to introduce, first of all, my partner, longtime partner, managing partner of, of GSC Ventures, Deborah Quazzo, and then a tech titan and a visionary leader who needs no introduction, Nadan Nilakani. Come on up. All right, uh, welcome back. And it is my distinct pleasure uh, to be able to have a conversation with the legend uh, Nanda Nilakani. Uh, and I actually want to start a little bit with your personal journey because I am fascinated. Uh, you know, it, it, he's a global tech icon. Uh, he got his electrical engineering degree from IIT Bombay, co founded Emphasis the vanguard of IT services, really, the first wave of entrepreneur, great entrepreneurs in 1981. Uh, he's just slightly older than I am. I graduated from college in 82. Uh, it's now over, an over $80 billion public company, and it wasn't lost to me that it was, you have recently re-emphasized the mission of emphasis uh, to focus on amplifying human potential. You were CEO from 2002 to 2007, now non-executive chair, I know you know all this. Um, 2006 Times Top 100 Influential People, Forbes Global Businessman of the Year in 2006. He's got accolades and awards coming out of his ears all over the place. You could have easily ridden away um, into a very early, because you would have been very young, retirement, uh, but you didn't. Uh, instead, you actually doubled down and committed to a life of public service, uh, and I'm sure other things as well. So you've widely, uh, you've become known widely as India's CTO um, because of the work that you've been doing. So in building the India stack, and many in the room know about the India stack, and many non-Indians don't know about the India stack. So I would just, as you, a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, so as you think about your journey, what is it that drove you to double down rather than, you know, taking your, taking your winnings and, and going to the beach? I guess I'm a sucker for punishment, but, uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think, uh, I got an opportunity in 2009 to serve in the government, and you know I was always inspired by business leaders who move on to do public service. So I thought I should do the same. And uh, the, the project was to give every Indian a digital ID. Actually, it was to give every Indian a unique ID. But since we were involved, we said let's make it a digital unique ID. So that was a twist. And uh, so I actually joined the government in uh, 2009. So I gave up at a nice corner office overlooking a golf course <laughs> with a few hundred thousand employees. And, you know, it was a good life. So I chucked that up to do a startup inside the government. And if anything more difficult than a startup, it's a startup inside <laughs> government. And I, had, uh, I didn't have an office, so I had a small table in the planning commission and uh, a, a, a motley crew of people who all had the same vision. But we were able to pull it off. So I, I served in the government for five years. And uh, we, we issued uh, 600 million digital IDs. And then uh, the government changed and the new government came. I met Prime Minister Modi. He, he was always a big believer in technology. So today, 1.3 billion people have the ID. It does about 80 million transactions a day in terms of authentications, maybe five to seven million KYCs a day. And it's laid the foundation for many other things, all of which layer by layer have become what's called as the India stack. Yes, it's remarkable. In fact, in the reading, the Adhar project, which is part of, uh, or is the core of the digital ID, um, I mean, imagine launching something that has a billion people. Um, I mean, how long did it take to get to the billion? Sorry? How long did it take to get to? Oh, it took about six, seven years. We, 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 we built a system to enroll one and a half million people a day. So at peak, we had 35,000 enrollment stations enrolling five, 50, 50 people per enrollment station. So one and a half million. But that was a massive thing because if you had a billion people, if you had half a billion people in your database and half a million and a million people enrolled, behind the scenes we had to do 500 trillion bi uh, biometric matches to ensure there was no duplicates. So it's a massive system. Yeah, it was actually called um, by one source as the biggest social project on the planet. Um, so it was extraordinary. 
What I, obviously this is an education and skills conference. Um, we talked a little bit before, uh, before about uh, some of the aspects there. Can you talk a little bit about the India stack, how critical it was to get the ID, to get the UPI, to get other pieces laid out? Um, and now with, this tra with those tracks laid, um, how important are they and were they to the full rollout of the education and skills and I appreciate those are actually two distinctly different initiatives, um, stack. Well, I think uh, uh, just to quickly sum up that, we had, as I said, 1.3 billion people with Aadhaar, uh, and then we also used this to build a DBT plan, a program where we connected the Aadhaar to the bank account, and the government could directly credit money into people's bank accounts. So during the pandemic, about 200 million people in India received cash directly into the bank account yep. because of emergency work for the vulnerable. So that was one thing. And then Aadhaar had a KYC which allowed uh, that's, bank, that's know your client. Know your customer, yeah. which is required for opening a bank account or uh, buying a mobile connections. And so the opening of bank accounts, a few hundred million bank accounts got opened. So there was massive financial inclusion. And also it was used by mobile operators like Reliance Geo. Uh, and they were able to enroll one million mobile customers a day using Aadhaar KYC. So they went to 100 million in uh, six months. So essentially, then that later on, I became an advisor to NPCI, and mm -hmm. they designed the UPI, which is uh, today about 8 billion transactions a month. About 300 million people use that. About 50 million uh, merchants have. Would you tell the Walmart story? Quickly? Yeah, it's and uh, you know, I mean, and you know, I think what's important to realize that we designed all this public infrastructure at population scale with the idea of building innovation on top. So just like Geo could use EKYC to give mobile connections, or Paytm Payments Bank could use it to give bank accounts, uh, PhonePay built a company on UPI, which is a great success. It's part of the Walmart family with Flipkart, and I think when they bought it, it was perhaps a relatively smaller part, but now it's valued at $12 billion. So I think that we think that if we can create population scale digital infrastructure and unlock the potential of the system, then you know, entrepreneurs can build on top of that yes. and create very valuable companies. You talk, and I'll kick it back to education. You, you use, I've, read, I've now read all of Nandan's books, so I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm generating revenue for you as fast as I can. And I've recommended them to everybody, so they're on my India list. Um, you use the words ubiquitous, universal, inclusive. Um, those words all infer democratization, right? Yes. And, and it's, this, it's the slow, it's slow, actually fast democratization of, of different pillars of the economy. And when, can you talk about that and then how that feeds into democratizing K-12 education, higher education, and then, you know, I guess separately the skills piece? Sure. So uh, one of the things I did after uh, I stepped down from government in 2014, along with uh, Shankar Maruwada, who's here, and my wife Rohini, we set up something called Eight Step to look at the challenge of uh, it was a nonprofit philanthropic initiative, problem challenge of education, and finally we settled on actually building some underlying digital infrastructure, which could be used at population scale, which was our sort of competence in some sense. Mm -hmm. And that was fortunately used by the government in the Diksha platform. So Diksha platform during the pandemic reached millions of teachers and children and was used heavily. So I think we, that foundation was laid. And now the government has come out with a very bold uh, new education policy yes. and also an architecture called NDR, National Digital Education Architecture. And essentially they have provided the ability to use the rails that have been laid uh, to, to provide uh, new innovations. For example, uh, we today have in India about 600 million textbooks which, are, which have QR codes in yep. them, an average of 20 QR codes per book for different topics. So 12 billion QR codes are out there, they're the rails. Yes. And somebody could build a pr product or a company which provides content or quizzes or whatever it is on top of these rails and directly get access to every child and who has these textbooks. So I think these are again another example of laying the rails and allowing innovation to flourish. Or there is a chatbot in Diksha called Tara which, in which you can plug in more capabilities. So somebody is talking of plugging in a doubt, 
doubt answering capability inside the chatbot. So there are many ways to think about this, but fundamentally, the exciting thing is that the digital rails for education and skilling are getting laid. Also, to address the challenge of uh, trust, we have built the whole infrastructure for verifiable credentials, uh, which was also used, by the way, in the pandemic. Uh, India has issued more than 2 billion digital, QR-coded, encrypted, safe vaccination certificates, which you can keep on your phone. Uh, so the same credentialing can be applied for education, education and skills. skills yeah. And then you can carry your credentials with you when you go for a new job or, or something else. So that infrastructure is already there. Again, people have to use this to create uh, startups. And then finally, we have a very important idea called data empowerment, which is how do individuals have access to their own data? So think about it like this. If I'm uh, driving a car on, on an Uber platform, and I build a certain history of good driving on that platform, then I sh if I move to some other platform, I should be able to carry my data with me. So data empowerment does that. So these are all building blocks. And then we have a protocol for discovery, you know, which is being used in the ONDC platform. So idea being that if we can do trust building, scale, uh, credentialing through, I mean, trust, have discovery solved, build the education rails, then some market person will use all this infrastructure in innovative ways to create value. So, so many questions that come off that. Um, so this is a lot of ed tech entrepreneurs in the audience. Um, and they go across what we call pre-K to gray, so K-12, higher ed workforce. Um, what's your advice you know, to them as they think about you know, building APIs or whatever to, to plug into the Endear in system or the skills system or, or whatever? Um, yeah, what's, what's your advice? And we talked a little bit about whether education, as you think about the stack, um, that education skills is a more difficult part of the stack than perhaps what's been built to date, um, all of which is heroic. Maybe comment a little bit on that and, sure. and what needs to you know, happen to continue to reduce friction um, yeah, and so drive adoption. You know, you know I think what, what we try to do is eliminate friction. So we believe that the only friction to adoption is motivation. Yeah. Everything else should be easy. But you know, if you're running a business, if I'm running a startup which wants, I, I, how do I get customers? So how do I do customer acquisition? How do I monetize that? So there are a whole new set of entrepreneurial questions you need to solve. So that is up to the entrepreneur to think of that particular product or service and how to acquire customers in a cheap way, how to retain them, how to increase the ARPU and so on. So that's business questions. But we think anyone who wants to solve this business issue at scale can use many of these building blocks which are available for free. And there are two ways to think about it. One is to use the APIs. Yep. So you, have, you use the APIs on NDR to do some uh, you know, uh, content on textbooks or chatbot uh, enhancement. Or there are a lot of building blocks that are open source in GitHub. And you can say, wh wh why don't I save time on, on this by just using these building blocks? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Because I think that certainly in the one of the bigger frictions in education innovation technology is distribution. And we've seen yeah. that issue in you know, in the CAC, in CAC issues and things like that across the across the industry. So from your perspective, India is providing a sort of a, a growth hack yeah. effectively to customers. That's right. I mean, look, it's it's you know, you 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 would still obviously, you know, build a, you know, maybe on, on a YouTube kind of platform, build a massive following like the Physics Wala or Cancer and all have done. And then your custom acquisition essentially is free because you're actually getting money to be on that pl platform, right? And then you can use that to then to give an app or a capability which you charge very, you know, a few thousand rupees, which you get paid through UPI. So, the, you know, that's where the right. other, other piece comes in. Right. And, and then you can, you know, build on top of all this stuff. You can, you know, you can provide content which connects to the textbooks. You can provide content which connects into the chatbot. So there may, I mean, and we don't even know what is going to be that thing. I mean, one of the things in payments which I, in my wildest dreams, I would not have thought about is something called a payment sound box. <laughs> so I said, what the hell is the sound box? So <laughs> the way it works is that if you go to, in India, has very, these very high volume restaurants <laughs> called darshinis, and they serve a dosa every second or something like that. And they don't have time to collect the payment. So they have a chat, they have a box there and 
suppose it's 100 rupees, he just points to the QR code and the, the box says 100 rupees received. So the guy, that, the guy serving the dosa doesn't have to, he just knows the payment is coming. Who would have thought of that, right? So, so, so I think I, ha I leave it to entrepreneurs to innovate on top of these things. Well, you talk about that, that India is not an advertising economy. It's, yes. a, it's a transaction, it's a That's commerce right. economy. And yeah. it is interesting to think about education transactions as, commer as part of the commerce and part of the dynamic there. No, that's because, you know, I think uh, you are going to go to more and more towards subscriptions. Yeah. You know, and, you know, so people are going to get a 5,000 rupee product for, uh, to get something. And then they can then also break the, Indians have to get, uh, be able to, you have to reduce the cost of entry. Mm -hmm. So then you can say, instead of paying 5,000 rupees a year, you pay me, you know, 200 right. rupees a month, 500 right. rupees a month. And then, you know, UPI has something called auto pay, which you can set up for that. So all these are, you know, tools that essentially allow entrepreneurs to configure and combine to create value. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, one of the things I love about the way you lay things out, I'm, I'm, his, I'm his book promoter, just in case you, you know, <laughs> I'll go on the road. Um, one of what, what I love about how you laid things out in the development of the current vibrant economy in India, um, fastest growing economy in the world, correct, um, is, you know, your analogy to, to a series of dominoes falling, I, I just That's loved. Right. And um, one of the dominoes, and since this room is full of entrepreneurs, is, is an, the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So maybe if you could just speak a little bit to what's happened since 1981 when you and your co-founders started sure. Infosys. Yeah. When, when, when we, Infosys began, in, in, India really didn't have startups. So you are the original startup in that sense. Because India was dominated by three kinds of companies. Of course, my friend Raji Pawar is there. They also began at the same time with NIIT. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we, we, you know, we had three kinds of companies. You had uh, companies owned by the government, these large public sector entities, ITI, BEL, SAIL. Or you had companies owned by multinationals, so you had the Indian subsidy of Unilever or IBM, of IBM. Or you had large family-owned companies, you know, um, the um, Muffet Lal, so the... Right. Tatas and so on. The notion that a bunch of first generation entrepreneurs were not bound by ethnicity, but bound by a common capability that they could all, they were all software guys, was a new concept. So I think that concept proved that anybody could do startups, right? So I think that, but took some time and even as late as uh, 2016, we had only 1,000 startups and now we have 90,000 startups. That's amazing. So there's been a massive explosion in startup energy and so on. and. You know, just to give an example, the IIT topper, you know, the IIT entrance exam topper in 2012 was asked, what do you want to be when you, when you graduate of IIT? He said, I want to be a scientist. And the IIT topper of 2021 was asked, what do you want to be? He said, I want to be Elon Musk. <laughs> this is pre-Twitter <laughs> Elon, this is pre-Twitter Elon Musk. <laughs> so I think the fact that the young, bright people want to be entrepreneurs, and we're seeing that, I was discussing with Sandeep and Manish, both of whom are on this panel, that, you know, in, the, in those days, 80% of the students went out of India, and now 80% stay here and build companies. So there's a massive shift in aspiration. Yeah, and it's critical to, to the progress that's been, been made, for sure. It's amazing. Let me go back to your comment about, and I, because I love this characterization as well. It's a concept we played with a little bit. You speak to the digital transformations being data-driven um, and that the footprint of, of their digital footprint will actually end up providing better access to healthcare, education, other sort of critical things. And um, you talked about the population getting digitally rich before it became financially rich. Maybe yeah. you could explain that concept. Yeah, so this is an idea that struck me, I think, like, Maybe I was you know, having a bath or something. I don't know when it struck me. But <laughs> the idea is that Indians, and actually it's true of many developing countries, will be data rich before they're economically rich. And my thesis is the following, that if a guy in Boston has a smartphone, he earns, say, $40,000 a year. If a guy in Bihar has a smartphone, he earns maybe $2,000 a year, his per capita income. Yep. Now, in the US, if somebody is earning $40,000, uh, but both have the same digital footprint, because they both are using the same phone and generating the same amount of data. The guy in Boston, that data is valuable to sell to him, because he can buy stuff. 
which is why the whole U.S. is an advertising-led economy. Now, in India, even if you, you can't sell stuff to somebody who doesn't have too much money, but he has this digital footprint. If you can take that digital footprint and allow him to get, for example, get better credit, or better access to healthcare, or better access to education, or better access to jobs, you have flipped it on its head and made data an ally of people to improve their lives. And we call that data empowerment. So yeah. India is the only country where we have a full architecture for data empowerment. Yeah, you're really the first country that's led in reverse, yes, almost, that's correct? Right. Yeah. It's just, which is just fascinating. Um, let me come back one more time. In January, I guess really three months ahead of what was projected, uh, India surpassed China in terms of population, which is um, remarkable. So you're now the, the world's largest and youngest democracy. Um, and just coming back to the, the idea of the stack supporting quality, skills, and education, and you also said that by 2030, India will be the, you know, sort of the, the, the power player in skills. Um, I'd love to just get your projection or your future, your future look at supercharging GDP per capita, what that'll mean, how, you, how fast India can get there. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday, sort of frustrated that it's not moved more quickly. And it, it kind of comes back to your point you just made, too. Um, but I'd love to just kind of get your prognostication on that um, sort of domino effect, effectively. Well, I think uh, uh, the big thing, the big unlock, one of the big unlocks is going to be this data stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have this whole system in the financial sector where people can start using their own data to get access to credit, which is mm -hmm. an important use case. Now, India has you know, about 11 to 12 million businesses registered in the GST system. And uh, in the latest budget, the government said that the GST system could join the account aggregator network, mm -hmm. which means that every company in the GST system can ask for its data back from the GST, which includes their tax filings and their invoices, which is signed by GST saying this is authentic data. Mm -hmm. And that data they can give to a lender to give them a loan or something. So the, what all this will do is it will essentially reduce friction to credit for small business, which is a big challenge. And if millions of small businesses get access to credit, then that gives them the capital to build their companies. And then they will create jobs. And once they create jobs, then there'll be pressure on skilling because the guy with the better skills is going to get the job. So I think we have to solve the demand side issue of job creation. And I think the skills will follow. Because job creation is the last shoe to drop, correct? That, that is the piece that, that is most needed. Yeah, and now. job creation tomorrow will happen because millions of businesses, each of them will create one or two jobs. So it's not just about a few companies like Infosys hiring thousands of people. It's also about millions of small businesses hiring one or two people each. And if this, that happens and they create 20, 30 million jobs, then those, those people, the ones who have better skills are going to come ahead. Where would you expect 2030 GDP per capita to have moved to? I, I don't know. Oh, come on. I, don't know. <laughs> I wanted to go invest on it. Um, amazing. So I've already spoken about this, but you have written um, a, a number of books about the, your vision for the future of India. Uh, the first book was, Imag was Imagining India. That was the idea of a renewed nation. That's how I got my job in the government. Hmm? That was when you were in the government. The, yeah. No, that's no. how I got my job. Ah, so I'm the only well, guy who got a job because he wrote a book. Interesting. That was 2009. You then did, then there was Rebooting India. That was Realizing a Billion Aspirations, 2015. And let's see, it should be about 2023, should be your next one. No, it's already out. It's called Art of Bitfulness. Oh, I missed it. Yeah. How'd I miss it? I don't know. <laughs> it's about keeping calm in the digital world. Keeping calm in the digital world. Are you going to write an education one? No, you know, maybe <laughs> next time. But, but the latest book is about you know, not getting too hassled because people just every morning see their WhatsApp forwards and get agitated, agitated and all that. So how do you become calmer in this whole world? Amazing. You're absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Well, we, we so appreciate your being here. This room, the packed room here to, to hear your wisdoms has been fantastic. And um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, thank you. Let's keep it going. How about one more round of applause for Deborah Nanda? Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and your vision and your message of empowerment.
and amplifying human potential.